Alrighty, um, so today we're going to be covering uh, the topic of VPNs. So, so far we've, we've looked at the firewall, we've understood a little bit about the concept of a stateful firewall. We've looked at how do we, uh, how do we build the foundation of a firewall and we saw that we really use this combination of zones and policies. And we're really building our our, our foundation of our, of our firewall to control what traffic gets between the zones. And we discovered that really we're going to have a zone which represents the outside world, and we'll have one or more zones which represent our internal network. Um, you also saw that a zone is a collection of networks that share the same security requirements. So if you can, if you look at, 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 a, at a one or more networks and you say, well, look, the traffic that's going into this network could really be the same as the traffic that's going into another network. In other words, I really don't need any different security between those two. They can go in the same zone. But if you look at a situation, you think, well, actually, I've got stuff in this particular network, or I've got, I've got servers or I've got requirements that really need to be treated differently, then you better off putting those, putting those servers into their own network and putting it into a separate zone. We looked at examples of that, like for example, if we had a web server. Well, the traffic that goes to, into a web server is different. Why is that? Because we need to allow traffic from the outside in to that particular server. Therefore, it needs to go really into a different zone than our internal zone we're not really allowing anything in from the outside. We've got our, you know, our file servers and our, and our data. The same goes for a, uh, a work server, a unified communication server, where we need to have traffic coming in from the outside. So we looked at zones, looked at how to create different zones and how to configure policies between zones. We looked at some of the other functions of a firewall. For example, we looked at um, screen options where we can set up different protections that are really looking for specific types of hacking attacks. Um, and then we look at the other thing which happens on a firewall, which is network address translation. <coughs> now we're going to look at the concept or the topic of VPNs. And the reason we're looking at VPNs is because our firewall, being our gateway device, is a logical place to set up a VPN and the, the goal um, of, of this type of VPN is to establish a connection between one site and another site. So we're talking about site-to-site -site VPNs. But the, the, uh, the term itself, the term VPN, which of course stands for Virtual Private Network, it's actually quite a broad term. It doesn't refer to one specific technology or even one, one specific method of achieving um, a, a connection between two points. It really refers to any type of private traffic that is being transported via a public network. So it's really private network traffic that is going over a public network. So whenever we have that situation occurring, it's a VPN. Now, having said that, it doesn't even need to be secure traffic. It doesn't even need to be encrypted traffic for it to be a VPN. It just needs to be private traffic. So in other words, there's some mechanism for identifying private traffic that's traversing a public network so the term, is, the term has been around for a, a very long time, even in the days of uh, frame relay, which we're going back for 20 years, before, that was really popular. Um, even frame relay traffic was referred to as VPN traffic. So, and why is that? Well, because frame relay provided a mechanism of sending private network traffic over a public network. And of course, the technologies have evolved and we have new technologies, but they still achieve these goals. So let's take a look at 
we're going to get into some of the concepts of, of VPNs. Um, uh, we're going to look specifically at uh, IPsec VPNs today. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to identify the types of VPNs. Uh, we're going to look at three major security concerns. So we are really for our discussion today we're going to be focusing on VPNs that do provide encryption and security um, and, and those those related things, we're going to get into those things, uh, bearing, in, bearing in mind that, as we just mentioned, there are VPNs that don't provide any of that um, generically. <coughs> um, and we are, we are going to spend, actually when we do our next topic, which is NPLS, we're going to get into those fucking VPNs in quite a bit of detail. So, <clears throat> we're going to get in. So let's look at uh, these three major security concerns. We'll look at IPsec VPNs, their functionality, configure IPsec VPNs using policy-based and route-based methods. There's a couple of different ways of going about that. And then we'll look at how do we monitor uh, these VPNs. But let's, let's look at the types of VPNs. So, um, as I said, like any time we have got private traffic or private network traffic going over a public network, it is a VPN. Um, <clears throat> so it is performed through tunneling, separating or securing different types of traffic. So the main point is that there is a, always a mechanism for identifying the private traffic. And there's always a mechanism for transporting that private traffic through a public network between two private endpoints. So the types of VPNs, we've got clear, clear text, layer 3 VPNs, uh, layer 2 VPNs, or VPLS. Now, with these VPNs, the um, certainly layer 2 and VPLS, which stands for Virtual Private Land Services, um, most of these types of VPNs are implemented by the service provider or the carrier, as opposed to a VPN that would be implemented by the enterprise itself. So the VPN we're going to be spending most of the time on today is the second type, the secure VPN or the IPsec VPN. And the implementation we're going to be discussing today is an implementation that a network um, administrator can implement. So it's really the, the enterprise, the, the organization itself, implementing this VPN without the involvement whatsoever of the carrier or the service provider. So you don't have to contact your service provider and say, hey, well, we're going to put in place a VPN. Um, you've just put in place your IPsec VPN between your two sites. So that is the type of VPN we're going to be spending most of the time on today. But just in the context of VPNs, there are VPNs where you would contact a service provider and you would ask your service provider to put a VPN in place uh, between your sites. And there are various reasons why you may want to do that. Depending on the scale of your operation, the amount of traffic, the types of service that you require, the quality of service um, that you require. Now, just to give you an example of a situation where the service provider, provider may need to be involved, we have um, just in our local region here, Gold Coast, we have our, our Gold Coast City Council, which has multiple sites um, around the region. And what they have done is they have gone to a, a local internet service provider and they have said to them, look, we want you to provide the connectivity between our sites. So essentially they've taken that area of, the, of their operations, they have outsourced it to an ISP. Why would they do that? Well, because really, when you think about it, an ISP is in the business of providing network connectivity. That's what they do, that's their expertise. So they 
they have a much higher level of expertise in that field than a, a city council would, or, or that a general systems admin or network administrator would have. And so they've gone to a local ISP and they said, we want you to provide connectivity between all of our sites. And so that ISP then provides them with a layer three VPN between their sites. Now, generically, that is not secure. That is not encrypted. It doesn't apply any, any kind of security at all. However, that doesn't mean you can't have security. And what, in fact, what is commonly done is you'll take a, a provider provision VPN, um, like a layer, a layer three VPN, for example, and then the provider will then put IPsec over the top of that VPN. So they'll create a VPN and then they'll encrypt it so they'll run IPsec over the top of it. The advantage of that, though, is, is that the provider's infrastructure is involved in the VPN process. So they can guarantee a certain quality of service that you can't guarantee when you've only got the site-to-site -site VPN which are created by enterprises themselves. Why is that? Well, because internet traffic, by its nature, is known as best effort. Okay, so when traffic goes out onto the internet, there's no priority given to the traffic generically or by default. And so its delivery method is best effort. So if, if we can deliver it, we'll deliver it. But if the network is congested, well, it might get dropped. And so that is the that is just the mode of delivery of general internet traffic. So when you have an enterprise to enterprise VPN, where the server provider is not involved, the traffic that goes out between those two enterprises is considered as general internet traffic. So its, it's delivery mode is best effort. Whereas if you get the service provider involved, you can um, have a higher priority of your traffic so that your traffic will take priority over other general internet traffic. So there are some advantages for getting the service provider involved. Um, of course, there's more cost, but then it comes back to what are, what other requirements, what sort of connectivity uh, do you need? Okay, so we've got this third here. We've got the combination of clear text and secure VPNs where we are really running IPsec over the top of um, a what would be a by default a, a non-secure VPN. <clears throat> so we're going to be focusing on, as I said, we're going to be focusing on the secure VPN, which is really the site-to-site -site, um, enterprise provision VPN. And you'll notice that looking at this slide, the technology right in the middle there is IPsec, which stands for Internet Protocol Security. Yeah, IPsec. Um, so, excuse me. So the purpose of um, <clears throat> purpose of IPsec, the purpose of an IPsec VPN, is to provide a secure channel across the internet. So we're going to be looking at a few things here. We're looking at encryption, payload verification, and authentication. Now, I just want to say that these are three separate themes. Okay. Encryption deals with one particular requirement. Payload verification deals with another. And authentication deals with another. So there are three different mechanisms that we use really in combination with each other to ensure these three things. <coughs> so obviously the objective here is we've got private networks on each end. Um, of this communication with our traffic traversing a public network being, of course, the internet. <clears throat> and we have our packet encrypted. So it becomes encrypted at one end and gets decrypted at the other end. So let's take a look at what are our issues, what are our concerns, what are the things that we need to deal with um, in this secure private um, network, or virtual private network. 
So our first concern is confidentiality. What does that mean? Keep our data secure and, and hidden. So confidentiality would mean that if our data that we are transmitting across this public network, if that data happened to be intercepted by a third party, um, if we are able to achieve our confidentiality goal, it would mean that that third party will not be able to understand our communication. It would be encrypted. It would be meaningless to that particular third party. So that's our that would be our confidentiality goal. Um, our integrity goal is to ensure that the data remains unchanged. So what we're saying there is that the data that was sent is identical to the data that was received. So we don't want it to have been made corrupted in the process. We also don't want it to have been intercepted and deliberately changed in the process as well. So we want to ensure, we want to have some mechanism for ensuring that what was received is identical to what was sent. And then there's authentication. We want to be assured that the that the endpoints of the communication, the parties that we believe we are communicating with, are in fact those parties. So we don't want to be accidentally or in some way um, deceived into communicating with a bogus third party. So the other end of the communication goes back to the wrong person. So we want to be able to verify the endpoints of our communications to ensure that we are in fact communicating with the person or the, or the device or the endpoint that we think that we are. So they are our three concerns, they are our three goals. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at how do we uh, how do we achieve those goals. So the first one of confidentiality uh, is going to be achieved through data encryption. <clears throat> so encryption provides confidentiality data is of course encrypted and decrypted and we do that using keys um, <clears throat> there are two types of encryption and it's important to understand that the fact that there are two different types of encryption there is symmetric and asymmetric so what is symmetric encryption any mm -hmm. ideas what symmetric encryption might be I said it was symmetric. What does that mean? Symmetric encryption. Well, essentially, symmetric encryption means that the key that I use to encrypt the data is the same key that is used to decrypt the data. Symmetric encryption. And that has been, I suppose, the most commonly used method of, of encryption. So that if there is some code, some um, some some key of saying, well, this is my encryption, um, this, this is how I'm going to encrypt the data. If I have the same key and reverse the process, then I'm going to end up with plain text. So the process we start with plain text, we encrypt it, we encrypt our data, we then convert it to cipher text, we then trans Commit our data through some means, and we then decrypt our cipher text back into plain text. So the symmetric process is that the key that we use to encrypt is identical to the key that we use to decrypt. Okay, now um, years ago the process would be that you would actually transport those keys between the two endpoints. So there was some mechanism where the keys were transferred, or the keys were distributed between the endpoints that were going to be using this form of encryption. So there would be some physical means of, of, of transporting keys. Now, what about asymmetric encryption? Asymmetric encryption is different. Asymmetric encryption means that we encrypt it with one key, but we decrypt it with another key. And we'll take a look at that. Um, in a little bit more detail later on. So the price, so the process, of course, is reversible in that we can decrypt what we have encrypted. So some basic forms of uh, 
encryption. We look at this symmetric encryption. Symmetric keys are fast, are fast at bulk data encryption. What do I mean by bulk data encryption? Well, that means that we have got a network in which we are sending traffic across that network, and we want to encrypt all the traffic that goes across the network. Of course, a, a virtual private network would be an example of that. So everything that goes across the network, we want to encrypt. That's bulk data encryption. So if we're going to do bulk data encryption, we are going to want to use a symmetric key. Why is that? Because it is much faster, it's a, it's a much faster computational process to encrypt and decrypt with a symmetric key than it is with an asymmetric key. There's a vast difference in the complexity of those two operations. Now, the bigger the key, the more secure the encryption. Why? Because it's more difficult to crack that key. Okay, so, the, so the larger the key, the more secure. Um, but the larger the key, the more computationally difficult it is to process the encryption. So they're taking the processing power to encrypt and decrypt with a larger key. Um, but it is more secure. Okay, so examples of um, symmetric encryption. Um, algorithms are DES, 3DES, and AES. Okay, so they are symmetric. You need to know this. You only need to know what algorithms are used for symmetric, what's used for asymmetric, and algorithms that are used to achieve our authentication. So we have an original key. We have encrypted data. We have decrypted data which is decrypted with exactly the same key. So we start off with plain text, we go into cipher text, and we um, decrypt back to plain text. Okay, now we have um, the issue of confidentiality. So what we've been talking about is just go back a little bit. Uh, to look at this confidentiality. So let's take a look at public key encryption. Now this is an example of asymmetric encryption. So why are they used for strong encryption? Slow we use for bulk data encryption. So in actual fact, it is so slow that it is impractical to use it for bulk data encryption. That is the issue with asymmetric encryption. Key sizes range from 512 to uh, 48. Now, examples of public key encryption are RSA and DH. In actual fact, DH is not an encryption technology. RSA is an encryption technology. We'll go and take a look at these um, later on. But DH is, um, we'll get into DH. We'll talk about exactly what that is. So we started with a what's known as a public key. We then have the uh, the receiver. So the sender and receiver, the public keys are available to, or can be available to, to everybody. So the receiver sends the sender their public key. So if I am the receiver and you are the sender, I will say to you, here is my public key. So in this process, there are two keys involved. There is a public key and a private key. We'll take a look at this in a little more detail, but there is a public key and there is a private key. Now, the thing about the public and private key is that, is that they are mathematically related to each other. So there is a mathematical relation between the public and private keys, but the mathematical relation is such that if I have the public key, I am not able to compute the private key. Okay? So it would, be, it would be impossible to work out what is the private key if I have the public key. So what happens is I have two keys. I have a private key and a public key that are mathematically related. I give you the public key. 
uh, you take the public key and you encrypt the data. You encrypt it using RSA as your encryption algorithm. You then send me the encrypted data. Uh, I would then take my private key and I would decrypt the data using the RSA algorithm. All right, so that is known as asymmetric encryption. It's encrypted with one key, but is decrypted with another key. So the reason it's slow is because it takes a lot of computing power to actually do that process. So if you're sending traffic across a network, that's not what we're going to be using to encrypt that traffic. Okay. <clears throat> but I just want to cover that because we will use this for other things. We are, we are going to use this. We're not going to use it to encrypt all of our data that's going across the network. We are going to use it, but we'll look at where this, where this fits into our picture. Okay, um, our next um, concern uh, is integrity. So we want to be assured that the data we receive is identical to the data that was transmitted, that nothing has changed in the transmission. And the way we do that is we use this one-way hashing algorithm. <clears throat> so a hash is essentially an algorithm that you take the original data, you run this algorithm over it, and that algorithm comes up with a number. So it looks at the data, which is a series of ones and zeros, obviously, in different data, and that algorithm will, from, the, from that data, compute a number, which is known as a hash. It's just a number. <coughs> it's a fixed length number. The actual length depends on the algorithm that I use. Here's a couple of them, um, MD5 and SHA. So the, the result of that algorithm, the number that's produced, is sometimes referred to as a message digest and sometimes referred to as a hash. <clears throat> okay, so MD5 actually stands for message digest 5 and SHK stands for secure hashing algorithm. So we've got MD5, produces a 128-bit output, and then we've got SHK1, 160-bit output, and SHK2 has variable, uh, variable outputs. So what we end up with is our data and a hash. So when the data is transmitted, this hashing algorithm is run, and we come up with a number. We then append the hash to the number. So here's an example of some of these hashing algorithms. Uses, a, uses the uh, modulus operation which is a mathematical function. <clears throat> so here's an example here. Given value 3, what was the original data? Um, so essentially the hash functions can use module operation in the hash creation process. The point of, um, the, point of the hash is that it's just a number. It's impossible to determine the data from the hash. Um, but the main, the main use then of, of this hash is that we create the data, we then create a hash, um, we then append the hash to the data, we then transmit the data with the hash. At the receiving end, the data is separated from the hash, and then exactly the same algorithm is used on our received data. So we create a new hash at the receiving end. We then compare our new hash with the hash that was transmitted. Now, those values should be the same. Right? If they're not the same, then we know our data has changed. Right? So what we're saying is that even if this data is intercepted, in the, in the process of being transmitted, it will be impossible for the person who intercepted the data to create, and if they wouldn't change, if they change the data, okay, 
it would be possible for them to also change the hash so that the hash that the changed hash would actually match the um, the hash that would be generated on the data at the other end. So what we're saying is the hashing algorithm is such that you can't reverse it to basically go go back and reconstruct the data, and you can't tamper with it. You can't you can't fudge it in such a way that oh I've changed the data like this now I need to change the hash to match my changed data. No, you can't do that. The algorithm is sufficiently complex that that is an impossible process. So the thing is. If the hashes don't match, you know that the data's been changed, because if they do match, you know that the data is good. What is the purpose of this? The purpose of the hash is integrity. Integrity of the data. So we know the data hasn't changed. What are the algorithms that are used? We've got MD5 and we've got SHA, secure hashing algorithm. Okay, so they, this is about integrity. This is not about encryption. This is about integrity. Is a difference. And what about um, authentication? <clears throat> this validates data going to verify that they came from the proper source. Source. <clears throat> so we have this HMAC uh, process, and this adds a secret pre shared key to the hashing process. Let's take a look at that. So if I have a sender, <clears throat> got a data, and we've got a hash key. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this this hashing key. Uh, <clears throat> we then add a key to the hash. We then send the data with the hash. So then we receive uh, the hash key. <clears throat> We're then able to use the um, a, a key. In actual fact, what we do here, to be absolutely precise, is that we encrypt the hash. Okay, so what we actually do here with this process, and the usual way of doing this, is that we encrypt the hash with a public key, and then we decrypt the hash with a private key. So, that, so the, the way of actually doing this is that we create a hash, which is actually a very small piece of data. We then use asymmetric encryption, to encrypt the hash. Okay, so we're not encrypting bulk data, we're encrypting a very small amount of data. We then send the hash, which is encrypted. We then separate the data from the hash. We use a private key to decrypt the hash, and then we compare the hashes. So what we are in fact doing with this with this um, at this asymmetric encryption, <clears throat> the reason it provides us with authentication. Let's just say over here, for example, the sender uses their private key to encrypt the hash. This is kind of a typical way of doing it. The sender will use a private key to encrypt the hash. The receiver uses a public key to decrypt the hash. How does the receiver get the public key? Well, that is that is transmitted. Okay? That is transmitted across a insecure channel. Um, to, from the sender to the receiver. Is that a problem that anybody can accept can potentially receive a public key? No, it's not a problem. It, what it means is that anybody could decrypt the hash. That doesn't matter. That's not the point. <clears throat> the point is that if I can decrypt the hash with this public key, what that tells me is that the hash must have been encrypted by the sender, because the only person that possesses the private key is the sender. So if I can use that sender's public key to decrypt something that they have sent, that verifies that that message must have been sent by that sender, because only they possess the private key. Okay, so. The general use of asymmetric encryption, or one of the uses of asymmetric encryption, is authentication. Based on that very principle, that if I can take your public key and decrypt something you've sent me, I know for sure 
that you were the sender, because only you possess the private key that encrypted it. Okay. <clears throat> so that is that is the principle. So, so we, that is the principle upon which most authentication processes um, are implemented. Okay, so not encrypting bulk data, we're encrypting the hash with this process, with this hash key, which is really the public private key. <clears throat> okay, so how are keys exchanged? Now, here's the thing. We are talking about, if we're talking about symmetric in encryption, um, one of the, uh, the age-old problems um, has been how do we securely exchange this key, this encryption key? So I'm going to encrypt with the same key that you're going to decrypt. How do we securely exchange uh, this key? Well, back in, uh, back in 19, 1976, uh, a paper was published by a couple of guys um, <clears throat> named Whitfield Bippy and Martin Hellman. And what they did is they had discovered that you could create a mathematical relationship between two keys. And by using this mathematical relationship, you could actually exchange information in or via an insecure channel that would allow you to create a separate key that was never exchanged. Okay, now, let me, just, uh, let me just show you um, the process by how this works. It's actually brilliant what these guys came up with. Let me just put this slide on the screen here. And we just want to run through. This is, I'm just taking a lecture from um, University of Texas. Thank you, University of Texas. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to look at is how does this, um, how does this, this work? So, <clears throat> So this published it was paper, uh, the paper that was published by by, by these two guys um, were actually mathematicians. So that they came up. So the, so the problem they wanted to solve was how do we how do we distribute this key, or how do we end up with both sender and receiver having the encryption key without having to send that encryption key across an insecure channel. So the process kind of goes like this. We've got the two parties which are communicating is Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob want to send encrypted data to each other. So the first step is Alice and Bob agree on a prime number, which is say P, and a base, which is G. Now, neither of these two things are secret. This is the key. These two things that they agree on don't have to be a secret. <clears throat> um, Alice then chooses a secret number. Now, this is secret. This is A. And Alice sends Bob G to the power of A mod P. Okay, and that's a bit of maths in there. You don't have to understand it. Okay, if you do understand it, fantastic. If you don't understand it, it doesn't really matter. The main point is that we use some really super, super duper maths here. Okay. So Alice is going to send Bob a number. And the number that Alice sends Bob is G to the power of A mod P. Bob also chooses a secret number, which is B. And Bob sends Alice G to the power of B mod P. Okay, so the, the, number, that is, the number that is sent um, is... A combination of the secret number, the base, which is G, which is known by both parties, and a prime number, which is P, which is also known by both parties. So the P and the G uh, are, are, are publicly known. So both parties know that, and it doesn't really matter who else knows that. Okay, anybody can know that. Um, Bob can, Alice can send Bob um, a message saying, "Hey." Uh, Here's my prime number and here's my base. Okay, that message can be intercepted by anybody. It doesn't matter who else knows that. 
that is not a secret. But the secret number A and the secret number B, they are secrets. Those numbers are never exchanged, they're never transmitted. Okay, so basically what happens is um, uh, Bob, Bob gets um, G to the power of A mod P, um, and Alice receives uh, G to the power of, of B mod P. Alice then computes uh, G to the power of B mod P to the power of A mod P, and Bob computes G to the power of A mod P to the power of B mod P. And guess what? <clears throat> Those two computation um, processes result in exactly the same number. Okay? So though those numbers, what they do is they then produce an identical number which is then used as the key. All right, so the process here is that the numbers that are exchanged are not secret, but we are using a secret number to produce those numbers that are exchanged, and then by using the number that is exchanged with our secret number, we are then able to generate a new number so what we're saying is that this here, g to the power of b mod p to the power of a mod p, and g to the power of a mod p to the power of b mod p, result in exactly the same number. Okay, the number that they result in becomes our key. So we are able to not exchange a key, but in actual fact, we are able to create a key. So what's happening is Alice and Bob are together creating a key, which is then used for the symmetric encryption process. So we're going to create a key, which they will then use to send encrypted data to each other. Now, the encrypted data can be intercepted and it cannot be decrypted because of the complexity of the key that they have created. The P, the value of P and the value of G can be intercepted by anybody and still not give them the ability to figure out what the resultant key was that they created. Okay. So basically it is quite a quite a brilliant process of creating together a key. So not, they're not exchanging a key. Even though it is called, this process, by the way, is known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange process. Okay? So what they are doing, they're not actually exchanging a key. They are, in actual fact, creating a key. They are creating a key. <clears throat> and that key is then used for symmetric encryption. So what we end up with is a... <clears throat> A, a, a secret number, A, and then a public number. So the public number is G to the power of A mod P. Okay, so what we've also created here in this process is a private and public key. So when we're talking about, when we talked about earlier on the asymmetric encryption process and there was a private key and a public key, well, in this scenario here, Alice's private key is the secret number A. Alice's public key is the number G to the power of A mod P. Now that becomes the public key. So we've really, in this process, done a couple of things. We've created a private key and a public key, but we've also, together, created an entirely new key which will be used for the symmetric encryption process. Okay, so that is the uh, what's known as the Diffie-Hellman algorithm or the Diffie-Hellman key encryption process. Here's an example here. Um, Alice and Bob agree on P equals 23 and G equals 5. So Alice chooses A as her secret number and says... Uh, 5 to the power of 6 mod 23, which equals 8. So that becomes Alice's public key. So 6 becomes Alice's private key and 8 becomes Alice's public key. B chooses 
uh, B was 15. That's Bob's private key. B sends 5 to the power of 15 mod 23, which equals 19. So in this case, 15 is Bob's private key and 19 is Bob's public key. Alice computes 19 to the power of 6 mod 23, which equals 2. And Bob computes 18 to the power of 15 mod 23, which also equals 2. Okay, so the 2 then becomes the shared secret which is the key used for symmetric encryption. Okay, that is, that's what we're encrypting. Now, the beauty of this process <clears throat> is that you can, come, you can come up with new keys, you can change the key, you can um, generate new keys as often as you want to. So you can use the symmetric key for an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever you think you want it, how long you want to use it for, until you think, actually, I think we need to change our key, just run the process again, come up with a brand new key. Okay, so the, the, the key, the secret key, um, <clears throat> the value of, of that key can never be um, figured out by knowing that P equals 23 and G equals 5. Okay, unless you know the value of A and the value of B, you can never figure out that the symmetric key is going to be 2. And because those two other values, the value of A and the value of B, because they are always kept secret, um, the value of the shared key can never be figured out. Okay, so that is, uh, that's the Diffie-Hellman key exchange principle. Um, interesting enough, this was, this was uh, published back in 1976 and today it is this concept that forms the basis of our entire public encryption process. So all commercial transactions, when you put your credit card details onto your website, that's, this is the process that's protecting you. Okay? Is this process that we're taking today. <clears throat> Obviously, we use bigger numbers, but is this process that, that protects your data today? Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> how are keys exchanged? Um, encryption and hashing both line keys. Um, so manual configuration is prone to configuration errors and very difficult to change. In other words, we don't, we don't change the keys very often. If we use an automatic exchange, we use public connections, how do we secure the key exchange? The solution is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm, first published, which is the first published standard for public key cryptology, solves the key distribution problem through the use of public and private key pairs. Only the public keys traverse the network. So as we saw in that example with uh, Bob and Alice, they only give each other their public key. They never distribute their private keys. <clears throat> so only the public key traverses the network. So what we do with this here, of course we haven't got Bob and Alice, what we've got is a gateway on one end and a gateway on the other end. So SRX device on one end, SRX device on the other end. It is the device itself that that engages in this process. So the devices communicate with each other. They are sharing the keys and they are between themselves generating what is known as a session key, which is that which is in actual fact um, a symmetric key, a key which will use which is going to be used for symmetric encryption. Okay, so <clears throat> Diffie Hellman groups um, five five sets of very large prime numbers. So the key the key put on this whole process working is that we must use prime numbers. Um, and there are some groups of prime numbers that are used. They serve as the modulus for the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Jupyter network support groups one, two, and five. So here we have groups of numbers. 
Uh, group 1 uses the 768-bit uh, prime, group 2 is 1024, and group 5 is 1536-bit prime, bigger numbers. The bigger number, the more secure, but also the slower the process as well. So there was a trade-off. <coughs> okay, um, let's take a look at the key exchange process again. Each device generates a public and private key pair. <clears throat> the public keys exchange across the network. The resultant is a session key. Okay, so just like the sort of analysis, the two devices together create a session key using the Diffie Holland key exchange process. So the session key then is used to encrypt the data at one end and decrypt the data at the other end. Okay, using symmetric encryption, and as we saw earlier on, it is symmetric encryption that is used for bulk data encryption. So all traffic that traverses our VPN is encrypted with the session key and decrypted with the session key. Okay, bulk data encryption. <clears throat> okay, so we've, we've taken a look at key exchange, we've taken a look at the concepts of how we create this session key. Let's take a look at sort of the details here of IPsec itself and how IPsec works. <clears throat> um, what we might do uh, before we dive in, into uh, into this, we'll take a we'll take a short break. Um, let you. Uh, Clear your mind a little bit, and then we'll get into the details of IPsec itself, and we'll see exactly how this works. Okay.